So on that note about stamina, we have one more speaker. We began with a uh, we began with a fast talking Texan. Uh, we will finish with a fast talking Irishman. Um, we also have heard mostly throughout. Um, We've seen a lot of pictures of the United States, occasionally with New York State or New York City superimposed as a tiny little um, uh, picture on that. The last speaker uh, is Michael Dowling, who has essentially lived his professional life in the local healthcare market. Um, he's currently president and CEO of the North, North Shore LIJ uh, Health System, a position he's held for close to a decade now. Um, prior to that, he's ho held a range of top-level po posts in New York State government, uh, including, um, among other things, seven years as State Director of Health, Education, and Human Services. Um, my wife also pointed out to me, in looking through the executive board of the Advisory Panel on Medicaid Reform, uh, that he is a member of that as well. Uh, so he'll tell us something about how these broad nationwide reforms uh, fit into the uh, situation in the local healthcare market. Before I turn things over uh, to Mr. Dowling, I do just want to mention uh, that the social enterprise program certainly didn't run this event in isolation. And in fact, healthcare is much more a matter of our future rather than our past. We have relatively little background in thinking about healthcare and how these issues fit in. Um, with social enterprise more broadly. So we've had some critical partners in running this event. Uh, these include the healthcare and pharmaceutical management program at, uh, the, at the business school. Um, also the Mailman School of Public Health and Tom, uh, Tom will, uh, will provide concluding comments that uh, from the perspective of someone who actually knows something about healthcare rather than a naive observer like myself. And finally, the university-wide Columbia Alliance on Healthcare Management. Uh, so I want to thank uh, these various institutions in helping put together this day and the many individuals from these organizations in helping to plan uh, and organize it. And again, thanks to all of you for coming with that, Mr. Dowling. Uh, okay, thank you so much. Uh, I'm not going to use any overheads. Um, I'm just going to talk about a few issues that I think are important and then hopefully leave uh, an appropriate amount of time for questions. And um, my perspective on this comes from obviously uh, quite a period of time in academia um, and also in government, uh, 12 years. And of course now being, and also on the insurance side of the business, which I was, and now on the provider side. And um, so I'm going to try to be brief and then allow time for questions. Uh, but what I'd like to start with is a few general comments and they pertain a little bit to some of the things that were said by the previous speakers, by Bob and Tom and others and Mark. Um, and I, I hopefully at the end that they will all connect in some way or another because um, as I will mention in a minute, I think this is a very exciting time and something that we should all look forward to um, with optimism. I am not a pessimist. And uh, these days when you go to most healthcare business meetings, uh, it's very pessimistic about things that are going to go wrong and things that are not working right. And um, difficulties that uh, come down from Washington or come down from Albany. I happen to take uh, somewhat of a different view, which I'll comment on in a few moments. But just a few things at the beginning, and for a few of you that were here that were at the Cranes uh, business meeting yesterday morning, I mentioned some of these things. So you'll hear a few of them for the second time. But one is, uh, I would just like to emphasize to everybody that um, not everything is all wrong with the American healthcare system. There is a lot that is right with it. And I think that's very, very important. It seems like we have a business that feeds on the negative consistently anymore. But if you have any experience with real healthcare systems in other parts of the world, you long for some of the creativity and the innovation that exists in the American healthcare system. So there's a lot that is right with it while acknowledging there is a lot that needs to be fixed, but this is the case with almost every institution in society. You take the energy system, the retail systems in any field, 
take the educational system, there are things that need to get better, and healthcare in that regard is no different. But that's not the image you would get from some of the people who just talk about the negativity all of the time. I think that does a disservice because I would argue that parts of the, the part of the problem that we have with the healthcare system in the United States is that we're suffering not from a failure but from a crisis of success. If you can just think back a decade ago to what was possible to do in healthcare and think of what it is we can do today, it is absolutely phenomenal progress. I picked up the Wall Street Journal a couple of days ago and there's a big front page article in one of the sections about the, the extent to which people now in their 30s and 40s, relatively healthy people, who now can get knee replacements, shoulder replacements, and, uh, and other orthopedic implants to improve the productivity of our lives that we could not even conceive of being able to do five or ten years ago. Now that's progress, okay? And part of the reason that we are, have a crisis on the cost side to some extent is because we've been so good at doing so many things so well over the years that we're keeping people alive longer so it's harder to afford the cost of taking care of them during the end years of life. That's progress. So I think it's important to keep this in mind um, and also to understand that the extent to which through medical science, which is advanced at an extraordinary rate, that we have been able to do so many extraordinary things that we have to understand in the equation of looking at costs, we have to understand the benefits. If somebody stays healthy for another 10 or 15 years and works five or 10 years longer than they would otherwise because of a debilitating energy in injury, but they are now working because of an advancement in healthcare that gets them to, to get things that they couldn't have got before, we never calculate the benefit side of the equation and only the cost. So I do think that in any analysis of this, we have to have a little bit more of a balanced view. That's point number one. Point number two is that we're obviously entering another period of transformation and austerity. And that will last for the next decade or beyond. But it's not the first time we've done this. You go back, for anybody who's been in the business a long time, you go back over many decades, we've had these issues before. We've had many health reform movements. You would suggest, you would you'd think, by the way, with some of the presentations, that this is the first time we've had a health reform movement. We've had them many times before. All you've got to do is think of the 60s, think of the 70s, think of the 80s. We've been through this game before and through these chapters before. But one of the things that we have to continue to look at as we look at all of the issues on healthcare going forward is we have to think about recalibrating our expectations. We can't necessarily all the time get everything we want all the time. I was always struck by the debate about the health reform legislation that was passed last year. It was emphasized, and I understand the politics of this. I was in the political world. I understand the politics of this. But it was always made very clear we will do all of these things, but nobody will get hurt. We will expand this, expand that, reduce cost, do everything, but we will not touch anybody's benefits. That is unsustainable. That attitude is unsustainable. That everything has to be on the table if you want to, for example, deal with the cost issue. And on the cost issue, just a general point I'd like to make, and that is that I do not see, I agree with Tom Scully, I do not see the cost coming down at all. I do see it continuing to go up. And what we can hope for the best is it goes up at a slow, slower rate than it went up before. And you can get scared a lot of people with all of these charts. Um, but if you just think about the cost issue, what drives it? One, there is inefficiency in the system. That was mentioned. And we should do everything to take all of that out. Two, however, is you've got the demographics. You've got the aging of the population. Understand that's 8,000 people turn 65 every single day of the year. So it's kind of foolhardy to say, by the way, we have a problem with the growth of Medicare. Well, one way you, cost, you change the growth of Medicare is that you obviously can cut payment levels, but you can also change who's eligible for Medicare, or you can cut the benefits that the people get who are on Medicare. But what what's primarily being talked about is you cut what you pay people. Now, some of that is legitimate. Don't get me wrong, I'm not defending. And the hospital sector here. Some of that is legitimate, 
But you also got to look at the other sides of it, because if you have 82 million baby boomers turning 65 in the next decade, m many of us in this room, looking around here, there's many of us baby boomers. We're moving into the Medicare caseload. Okay? And we will stay there for a long time, hopefully. Partly because of the success of healthcare. We hopefully will stay there a long time, but there is a cost to that. Nonsensical to suggest that there isn't. Question is, you have got to do a multitude of things to reduce that cost. The other reason for the cost driver, of course, is technology. It drives the bulk of the healthcare cost, is being able to do things today you couldn't do before. Per unit of what we get paid in hospitals today are doctors, what we get paid for doing something today is less than what we got paid many years ago, but the cost has gone up because we do 10 times more of them today than we did years ago. And the reason we do more of them today than we did years ago is because we can do them today and we couldn't do them before. Because technology has advanced to a degree that's extraordinary and all, and all you have to do is spend time in the healthcare field on a day-to-day -day basis to look at the extraordinary advancements that are occurring each and every day, including the, the, resulting, the results from the mapping of the human genome, where people are now cause, talking about customize this and customize that. Now you can argue that's progress or that's a cost. In fact, it's both, but you've got to look at both sides. The other thing, of course, with regard to um, the, the cost issue, and I completely agree with Bob's last slide that he put up here, is that I am very, very pessimistic unless we change lifestyle and behavior. Um, so much of the healthcare cost is driven by lifestyle choices. And that becomes the responsibility of each and every person. So health reformer, when people say, who is the person who will reform healthcare? My answer to that is each and every one of us. It's what we do with ourselves and how we eat and how we exercise, et cetera, et cetera, and how we take care of our kids and we reduce the, uh, the obesity epidemic over time. Because if we don't, I completely agree. And being in the hospital, it's kind of ridiculous anymore. Where we now, as distinct from many years ago, in the waiting room of one of our pediatric areas, we got to buy chairs that can see two human beings at the same time, but it's not for two human beings, it's for a kid. It's for a 12-year-old. That is our societal responsibility that goes way beyond the insurance company necessarily or the provider of care. It is a generic issue that we've got to get very, very, very serious about. But here again, we don't like to be told what to do because we want it all. That said, however, the, general, of the last general point I'll make is that this is a great time to be in healthcare. It's a great time to be in this business because it's an opportunity for extraordinary creativity. And while there are challenges, it's important to understand that every challenge, in my view, is, a, is an opportunity in disguise. It's going to challenge our creativity and our innovation and our intellect over the next 10 years and beyond, and I think for those of us who are in the healthcare field, and those of you in the, in, the, in the audience who are in the healthcare field, it's an extraordinary time to do things very differently than we've done before, and challenge tradition. You know, selectively forget the past. Forget the fact that we did it this way before, we have to think about doing it differently in the future. And so it is very, 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 a very creative time, which I think is just absolutely wonderful. So let me mention, now let me go and make a few comments on the reform uh, legislation. Understand something, in my view, there is nothing in it that is terribly new. Now you can talk about some mechanisms that there are little timetables for this and timetables for that, but everything that's in the legislation was discussed for the past 10 years. So anybody that's surprised with anything that's in the legislation hasn't been paying attention for the last decade. Everything that is in there, the discussion about covering everybody, how long have we been discussing covering everybody? Now, make, make, I just want to make one point, though. Covering everybody and having everybody have insurance doesn't mean anybody has access. Insurance coverage and access are not the same. We have this phenomenal problem in New York State where we have so many people covered under Medicaid, but they don't get access to the right care because it is based upon what kind of delivery system you have in the community. It's based upon what you pay because if you cover everybody and only reimburse the doctor a little bit, why do so many doctors not take Medicaid, take Medicaid in New York State, even though Medicaid, most people have Medicaid? 
because we don't pay doctors enough to take a Medicaid patient as, this, as compared to a commercial patient. So in many areas that are covered by our, our healthcare system, there are very few physicians that will take Medicaid, yet everybody walks around with insurance. They come into the emergency room with insurance, so we get a little bit. So you can cover everybody, but we won't know exactly what happens until you figure out how much, to cover, how much the people who are supposed to be taking care of them are paid to find out whether or not they have access. So don't ever confuse coverage with access. Um, but that is nothing terribly new in the legislation. Um, and many of the changes, many of the things that have been discussed in the legislation, by the way, have been tried and have worked in some place, in many places around the country over the years. There have been wonderful, you know, um, crucibles of, of, of innovation around the United States, including in New York. Some very interesting things have been going on. So it isn't like things are just beginning to start for the first time. There's a lot of good things going on. Just in New York alone, and I will say this up front, um, while there are wonderful things going on in New York, generically speaking, there are more innovative things going on elsewhere in the country. So when I need to spend time figuring out how to do something very differently, I spend my time with the, with the Kaisers and the Intermountains and uh, the, the um, uh, Virginia Masons and the Centaras of the world that are out there and the Geisingers somewhat unique, some of these places are somewhat unique, some of the things they say they do is not, they don't exactly do it the way they say they do it, and it's not as good as the press says they are, okay, because everything is obviously brushed up and made look prettier when it's presented on the outside, but New York is not the center of innovation in terms of delivery system reform. We should be and we must be, and that while there are pockets that are extraordinary, we are not necessarily in the lead on this, and we have to get that back and be Calm the lead, and that is the responsibility of people who are in leadership positions in healthcare. But if you look at New York over the past decade, we've had major consolidations. Um, you've got a couple of large healthcare systems in New York today. Most private in this part of New York, most individual ho hospitals have uh, no longer are independent, separate, distinct hospitals. They are all part of something else. And 14 hospitals have closed in the last 10 years in New York. When asked most people about this, they'll say, well, we know there's a couple of hospitals that have closed. St. Vincent's closed, St. John's closed, but remember, 14 hospitals have closed. 4,700 beds have been taken out of service. Okay. So there has been a lot of this turbulence over the past decade. Some of it good. Some of it has worked very, very well. Some of it hasn't worked well at all. And there has been some negative downfall from some of it. But it isn't been a static environment been pretty chaotic, quite frankly. And, and I think more of that will happen. So let me go through a few things of what I think will happen, or at least should happen, over the next number of years in New York. Uh, one is that you're going to have more consolidation. There will be more hospital closures. You will end up with three probably, if maybe four, large healthcare systems in New York. I'm now talking downstate New York. I'm not including Buffalo, Rochester. I'm talking at this market here. We'll have a couple of very large healthcare systems. They'll be different. Some will be organized as coherent, integrated systems, and others will be organized more loosely. Okay? And there's a big difference in what you can do depending on how well they're organized and structured and administered and governed. Loose governance structures, loose administrative structures don't allow you to do the things that you, that you should be doing to make the fundamental changes in healthcare. Um, you will, however, there is a major issue that we have, however, in the context of all of this consolidation, and that is that there are hospitals that if you look at them using any business analysis should close. But given their location, and given the populations they serve, and given the lack of services in those communities, some of them can't be allowed to close. And some of them are in bad shape, financially, quality-wise, etc., cetera, et cetera, because they're all linked. If you're not doing well financially, it's often very, very hard to put the investments in 
to make sure that your quality and your experience and everything else, patient experience and physician experience is doing well because you don't have the resources to invest. You don't have the capital to put into the physical plant. The physical plant looks lousy. It all spirals downhill. And some of these hospitals in the New York area are in that situation not necessarily because they're badly managed, but it's because they serve a population that is covered primarily by Medicaid or are uninsured. And you don't get paid enough to, in any condition, survive. So somehow those have to be either taken over by other health systems that are healthier without, without tipping the good healthcare systems into a bad situation by taking on so much of the bad stuff that they can't handle it, or they have to be specially subsidized by the state. So you just can't look generically and say, these hospitals are doing poorly, therefore they should not exist because there is nothing in the community um, to substitute for them if they disappear. This is a major policy question that is going to be addressed and discussed uh, over the remainder of this year and next year. New York State is well aware of this. New York City is well aware of it. Most policy wonks are very well aware of it. So we have to figure out a way to do this. There are others, however, that should consolidate and be forced to consolidate. And some should close. Okay. But you have to look at the New York market, not as a generic one market. It depends on where you are in New York. If you're in parts of Brooklyn, it's different than being in Long Island, and it's different than being in parts of Queens, and it's different than being in parts of Manhattan. It's very localized geographically so that you make sure you have the right complement of services. So that's one. There will be more consolidation. And I think it's good. Um, second thing is that there will be and is and should be more of as a major, major, major focus on quality, on performance outcomes, on quality, on patient satisfaction, and on um, the production system. That there will be a major, major focus on this. Uh, we've got to do better on the quality agenda, and we've got to take responsibility and accountability for making sure we, we, we show the right results and be willing to be transparent about putting them out front and out to the public. Most places don't make their data transparent. They should, and they must. Um, in our healthcare system years ago, we were the, one of the first to put all of our data on the public website. It's important, not only just from a consumer point of view, it's important also from an employee point of view because the employees don't like to have stat out, stats out there that don't make them look good. And so you see a complete change in attitude when they know all of the numbers are out publicly. But there has to be a major, major focus on the quality agenda. And that should be a focus irrespective of whether or not any legislation ever passed. We should not be doing these things just because the federal government passed legislation. It's kind of embarrassing that legislation has to force healthcare providers into focusing on these issues and being held accountable for the quality that they deliver. I saw one issue, though, that needs to, among many that, I, that you should be aware of. The problem on the quality agenda issue is um, there are so many organizations and so many groups nationally, including the federal government, that produce quality metrics every other week. So if you're on the provider side, it seems like every week there are 10 new metrics that you've got to comply with. You just can't do it. You get burnout. You know, you go to staff and say, you know, last week we told you about these 10 things we got to do. Now this week there's another new thing, things we got to do. And the staff says, wait a second. I didn't figure out how to do last week's yet. How am I going to do the new thing since I didn't conclude last week's? This is a huge problem. I, my lobbying effort has been pick five things, pick 10 things that you really want, stick with them, stop producing new stuff, you want zero infection rates, fine. You want dramatically reduced readmission rates, fine. You want a special statistic in terms of mortality outcomes, fine. You have specific statistics on sepsis, great. If we fix those, by the way, and could focus on those consistently without the constant interruption by every other group wanting to put something new on the table, you will get some results over time. By the way, this is not a New York issue. 
You go to meetings at any place across the country, this is one of the things that almost every provider complains about consistently. In our hospitals each and every day, we have outside reviewers in all the time. Right? Reviewing every single thing. Now you get to the point, I'm not afraid of these reviews at all, but you get to the point where it takes away dramatically from what you should be doing to get the results in the areas that really make a difference. Okay? Um, so that's one thing. Second thing that has to happen, and I agree with Bob, the previous speaker Bob on this, is that we have to break away from our addiction to the fee-for-service payment system. And here again, I think that we have to be taking the initiative. The fee-for-service payment system drives, produces incorrect incentives in so many arenas. Um, you get paid for doing a lot of things this way when you know, in fact, that what you should be doing is doing something the other way. We battle with this all the time. But remember, we're all economic animals. I have to be accountable to people that want to make sure that our organization is doing well. Wall Street wants to make sure our organization is doing well. In fact, Wall Street oversees our numbers all the time. So they want to know why are my numbers not getting better Right? Because we're rated by Wall Street, even though as a not-for-profit, Wall Street just treats us almost like any other organization, including organizations that are for profit, because we borrow and we float bonds, and we have bond investors, and you go to Wall Street, which I do on a monthly basis, and you sit down to Wall Street, they want to know why are the numbers not looking better, not looking better, why don't you do more of this, more of this, more of this, when in fact you can know that there are better ways to do that you should do it over here. The trouble is, I get paid to do it this way. I don't get paid to do it that way. So you're living in two worlds at the same time. And this is a fundamental issue, by the way, that every provider will be struggling with in the context of trying to meet some of the requirements from the federal law. My, my view is that over time, we have to enhance the transition to capitation or global payment. So you get paid a global payment to take care of somebody. Now, by the way, it's very interesting. Since I've been standing in the back for the last couple of hours, every speaker mentioned the Mayo Clinic, Geisinger, and, and uh, Kaiser as models. I'm very familiar with them. They do good work. But each one of them has their own insurance company. Each one of them controls the dollars coming in so they can pay themselves to motivate the right kind of behavior. They are not totally dependent on an, an, on a, an, a, a, an exterior insurance company paying them fee-for-service. Geisinger has an insurance company. So it has this unique program that it can follow patients after they leave after uh, heart uh, uh, interventions called a proven care program. But they're able to pay people to do certain things that are very different than what I can do because I don't get paid that way. Because I don't yet have our own capacity to take the, uh, have it the equivalent of an insurance company where we pay ourselves. In our healthcare system, one of the things that I am, um, we now have $250 million on the risk and it, over time to build the infrastructure so that we can get away, it'll take decades to get away from the fee-for-service method of payment. Then I think you have all the incentives in the world to, do, to move the money where the money should be moved to get the right outcomes that you want. So instead of paying the doctor this way, I can pay a different person another way. Complicated, difficult stuff, but I think it is the way that we have to do. We have to disrupt the fee-for-service payment system, and we have, to be in the, we have to take initiative to make that happen over the next decade. It's going to take a decade. This doesn't happen in a year. This is a complicated issue, a complicated issue. We actually took capitation 12 years ago at, no at Notre LIJ, and we were the first in the Northeast to do it, and we uh, lost an awful lot of money because we didn't have the infrastructure right. So we had to pull out of it, otherwise it would have sunk the whole place. Hopefully we've made an awful lot of changes up to the, uh, since then so that we're much more equipped to be able to do it today. The other issue that will happen and has to happen is that we, and was again mentioned by Bob, we have to integrate. What I mean by that is we've got to align the docs and the hospitals together. And the, and the plans. 
Um, it was mentioned a few times earlier today that all the plans are out there trying to force capitation new methods of payment. Well, if you negotiate with the plans every day, that's kind of news to us because that's what they say they want to do, but that's not what they actually want to do when you sit and talk to them about doing it. Um, so, you know, always be careful of what the public perception, the public image is of what, what people say and what actually really happens in real life. But we've got to be able to align uh, the doctors and the hospitals and, and the plans together so that you actually can create mutually collaborative, synergistic um, uh, uh, agendas so that we're all moving in the right direction. When we talked capitation years ago, the hospital talked to capitation, but the doctors were not aligned and we couldn't control what the doctors did, so the doctors walked the old way, we were trying to walk the new way, and we were paying for everything, so we had to pull out because we were losing so much money. Um, we have been, in our healthcare system, and it's, a, it's happening all over the place, we are bringing on more full-time physicians on staff. We now have well over 2,000 salaried physicians. I do think that is the way of the future. If it is done right, it is the correct way. It doesn't necessarily mean that all physicians have to be employed, but if you want to get into the business of taking risk, you have to move in that direction. Or you have to align the voluntary physicians that you are not hired by you, are not, are not on your staff, you have to align them with technology so that they're bound together where everybody shares the quality data and everybody is held responsible. Otherwise, it just won't work. Another thing that has to happen and is beginning to happen, but not as much as it should, is that we have to take much more of a community focus to the whole issue of, of health care. We, we are relatively good at taking care of people when they're sick as individuals, but in the communities around here, we have massive community pathology. And if you look at the indicators of what occurs in the communities in, in the New York area, which of course is an unbelievably diverse set of communities here, you have like, uh, you know, hypertension, um, substance abuse, drug addiction, smoking, obesity, which was mentioned. And the question for health providers is what do we do to address those? The tradition has been wait around until somebody gets sick, they come to the hospital, we take care of them. I think we have to shift our focus completely into figuring out how do you actually deal with all of those indicators in the community to create the sickness in the first time place? And this means, by the way, that hospitals will have to work with community-based organizations, we'll have to work with behavioral health organizations, alcoholism and substance abuse organizations, the rehab organizations, the dis dis disability organizations out there, the social service agencies. Because quite frankly, when you deal with many, many populations, the health issues are the minor issues. If you're in a poverty community, and I, I ran Medicaid for the state of New York for years, and we used to do things like the ACO that we talk about, it's not a new concept, by the way. It's been around forever. And the current definition of his ACO stands for any consultant's opinion. <laughs> um, uh, but when you go into many of these communities, the issues, the healthcare issues are the minor things. It's all the social issues are the problems. And if you don't deal with the social issues, you can't resolve the health issues. You deal with the health issues alone, just won't work at all. Way too complicated. And this is, an, this is an arena that we have to delve into much, much more, that most healthcare organizations are not that um, uh, equipped to deal with at the moment, although many are making ma major, major progress. We, by the way, in each one of our communities, we have developed a map of the health issues in the community by zip code almost. And we're trying to figure out now over the next couple of years, how do we address those issues in the community that over time will reduce, potentially reduce, what happens on the inpatient side. And you have to have the subacute, the postacute, the primary care, the home care, all of that has to be integrated and coordinated together. This is complicated issues. This, this kind of complication doesn't come through when you listen to presentations just about the legislation. The legislation is easy. I did that one time. That's pretty simple. It's easy to write it down and to say this should happen, but I'm often sitting there wondering about whether or not the people who write some of this have ever had any experience in the ground floor at all. And by the way, the regulations that just came out on ACOs, I don't know if anybody here read them, but a flock of lawyers must have just gone crazy because these, these 
uh, these regulations make absolutely no sense. And I don't know of anybody, I don't know anybody that wants to get into the SEO business based upon the regulations that came out. You just can't do it. They wrote them, so it's impossible to do what they said I want you to do. And it is micromanagement from government, from, the, all, from Washington, like you wouldn't believe, which, by the way, is something we should very, very well resist. If everything is micromanaged from either Albany or, Gov or, or Washington, and to try to tell you from an intellectual point of view how exactly you've got to do anything, it bears no relation to what happens in the real world at all. A couple of other things. One another, other thing is, goes back to something I said at the beginning. What do we do about lifestyle change? Let me ask a question and something we're, we're, we're uh, trying to tackle right now. We have 43,000 employees in our health system. We have major incidents of ill health among our employees, no different from most of us. We've got heart disease, hypertension, obesity, smoking, okay? How do we make our employees healthy? I pay the full cost of employees' health. We're self-insured. How do I improve their health? And how do I make the group healthier over time so that I improve the health outcomes and reduce the cost, or potentially reduce the cost? What do you do? You provide incentives through our benefit plan, if you, if you do physical assessments and you do some exercise, you get a reduction on the premium. We have walking tour, we have walking uh, programs, we have anti-smoking programs, we have anti-smoking counseling all over the place. All right? we, have, we pay for participation in gymnasiums so that people can go to the gym. So here now I have a captive audience, our own employees. So how do I do this? Now the reason I'm raising this is the idea behind an ACO is that you take a population, right, and you figure out how to make them healthier. They're not a population that works for you. They're just a population out there. And the regulation, by the way, one of the crazy things in the regulation is that the people who, the participants can be with you or not with you, they can leave, right? You, you don't have a, a set group of people because the way the regs are written, any person can get up and just leave. But come back to your, and many of your employers. How would you do it? Because if you can't do it for people whom you pay the whole, pay the whole cost for, and they work for you, how are you going to do it in an SEO? out in the community. How are you going to figure it out? We have, we, we have all of our campuses are non-smoking. Now, the issue of obesity is interesting. I mean, um, by the way, the Cleveland Clinic has taken the position that they will not hire a smoker. They refuse to hire a smoker. And the CEO of the Cleveland Clinic has been very public in saying if he could get away with it legally, he would refuse to hire people who are obese. Now I see eyes, you know, moving here and people are saying, oh my God. But stand back for the moment and ask yourself the question. My employed workforce is an ACO. Their health level is here, right? I want to move it to here and I want to spend less money. ACO, general population is here, they want to move it to here, less cost, improved outcome. How do you really do it? It's an issue that uh, is really worth lots of discussion because that is the essence of a lot of the stuff that's in the health reform thing. Now, you can take very tough actions that people will not like. And now remember, we're unionized. Okay? So now how you deal with that? I'm just throwing this out because we're struggling with this. 
concept I agree with, the idea I agree with, but I'm giving you this as an example. And if for those of you that hire people, let's assume you have 10 people working for you, tonight, as you go home, think about how would you improve the health of your 10 people that work for you. And if they don't comply with what you think is appropriate lifestyle behavior to improve their outcomes, what then would you do? One other item, education and training. Um, I am a major, major believer in the fact that we have to create in our organizations a culture of continuous learning where we have to provide maximum opportunity all the time for people to continue to develop. Healthcare is so complex, changes so fast, new technologies come on all the time. And patients, by the way, are with you for a short period of time under the current construct. Over time, hopefully, they'll be with you for a long period of time if you manage the continuum. But you have to be investing in education big time. Education is very interesting, and I believe, by the way, that we will never be fully successful till we change how we educate people. We educate in silos, and we ask people to work in teams. We have become so siloed over the years in almost everything. We want the docs to work with the nurses where you educate them separately. Um, <laughs> And on the medical education, which I also think has to be dramatically changed, you do know, for example, despite all the discussion on quality that has been talked about here today, in medical education, in traditional medical schools, there is very little education given on quality as defined by the, what the, the payers want these days. All you have to do is meet with a group of residents or fellows and ask them if they have any information about the new requirements on quality um, issues that the federal government appears are pushing, and they look with blank faces. They've never had access to it. Now, we're starting a medical school, uh, which will open, the first medical school opening in New York will be ours. With, we have a co-owned medical school between us and uh, Hofstra University. Its first class begins uh, August 1st. And we've completely changed the curriculum. All medical students will be trained in the first nine weeks as EMTs. They'll, drive, they'll ride the ambulances, and they'll be assigned to physicians in the community, to ambulatory sites, and to community hospitals immediately, and be assigned patients. You know, the tradition is two years of science, and then they'll throw you into a hospital after two years and say, by the way, here's a human being. Okay? We have two year, four years of science and four years of clinical. So you learn by doing. And you're out in the field. This is getting a lot of international and national attention because it is the very different from the way we've traditionally been doing it. We also plan to open a nursing school because there are thousands of qualified people who want to become nurses that can't get into nursing schools because the nursing schools only take X number of students every year. Because they will argue with you, and I've met with most of them in the region, they'll argue with you that they have no space, which I think is somewhat garbage, you can always find space, and they don't have enough faculty. So what we did a number of years ago is that I sent 75 nurses to Case Western to get their doctorate. I now have over 60 of them have graduated. I have 60 doctorally trained nurses. And I agree with whoever asked the question earlier about nursing. Nursing is central to providing great care. Many of our hospitals, by the way, in our system are run by nurses. But nursing is central. And, but it has to be an interdisciplinary approach between the nurses, the docs, and everybody else. And to help with this, we've created the country's largest patient simulation training center, where we do integrated training and interdisciplinary training.
the docs, nurses, everybody else around clinical issues and is constant. We can run 19 full simulations at any one time. Okay? And that's just part of the, I'm just talking about a couple of things that we're doing, but the, the whole idea about how we educate to meet the demands of what the requirements are in the future has to be very different than what we've done in the past. Because if we don't, we have a workforce trained one way and the requirements are very, very different. The biggest problem in healthcare and where most issues occur is teamwork and communication. It's not technical talent. It's communication and teamwork in almost everything that goes wrong. Yet we don't teach the teamwork and the collaboration in the way we educate. To me, nurses and doctors, for the most part, should, and to where it is at all possible, be trained together. Okay? So that they're not meeting for the first time and trying to acquaint themselves with one another <coughs> on the floor of a hospital. And there is this historic issue between doctors and nurses that goes back to the beginning of time. By the way, nurse practitioners should be used more and more and more as primary care people. Obviously, under the auspice of a doc. But there is no reason they can't be used much, much more in the community to buy, buy basic primary care. Because despite all the discussion this morning, there is no, not enough capacity in the communities out there or in the health systems out there to develop the local capacity to provide the primary care as part of an ACL. Doesn't exist. So you can have all the rhetoric you want. Doesn't exist. Now, we've got to create it. It's our responsibility to create it. I believe that healthcare organizations and hospitals and hospital CEOs, I think we've been a bit asleep at the switch. We've been a bit too tradition bound, a little too afraid to take some, to get out there and try something new. I think that's the responsibility of us. And just a couple of closing points. One is I'm very optimistic, despite what I've just been talking about, because I think it is a fantastic laboratory of innovation over the next number of years. If we don't, figure out new ways to do things. It's like the definition of leadership, as somebody says, is you manage the present, selectively forget the past, and create the future. That's what we should be all about. So we've got to be optimistic and upbeat, and it's a can-do. You know, when people ask you the question, I don't think we can do this, the answer should be, why not? Why not ask the question the other way and say, we can do this. Let's start from the premise that it can be changed. And I think that there is wonderful opportunity to change things dramatically. We should, however, not create unrealistic expectations. We definitely shouldn't create unrealistic expectations about the benefits of ACOs. We should not create unrealistic expectations about the degree to which we lower the cost spiral in healthcare. I don't think it's going to happen. I think we'll, we'll, we'll slow it down. But I think we'll set ourselves up for failure. Because unless we do a lot of things outside of the traditional provider system in healthcare to deal with lifestyle and others, you're not going to deal with that. You're not going to address that at all. It's a waste of time. And I think politically the people who stand up and say, we're going to reduce costs this much, I just think it's a, it's a fallacy. Um, we've got to be very careful to make sure that we don't fall into the trap of, of government micromanaging everything, because I think that would be disastrous. And that's what's beginning to happen now. If the ACO regs are any predictor of what happens in the past, nothing good will happen. And that's dangerous. We have to be careful about this. And also to understand that things will fail. You know, success is built on the back of failure. There will be failures. And so instead of, it's like when you're in a hospital and you have a central event or something goes wrong, which happens, it's a human endeavor. Things do go wrong. They'll always go wrong. What you have to do is try to figure out how to minimize what goes wrong. But you've got to be able to expect it, right, and put the processes in place so you can try to prevent more of it in the future. But acknowledge it and then learn from it so it doesn't happen again. And I'll end with a quote that I like, which is a quote by Churchill, who basically said that success is going from failure to failure without loss of enthusiasm. And uh, with that, I will stop here. And if there are any questions on anything, I'll be glad to take them for a few minutes. I thank you. Yes, so hi. I wanted to ask about with an aging society and the challenges in delivering health care, especially in a suburban 
community mm -hmm. like Nassau County, how does the hospital system address the transportation issues, how that plays a role in access to care? How are we in the future system going to deliver more services in the home, perhaps, right. or address those issues? Well, I, the, 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 the only way that I believe pers anymore, um, you know, as you know, we have huge home care and everything, but the, the way that you have the greatest chance of doing that is to be able to control the funds flow coming in. So if I have the dollars coming in, on behalf of a Medicare population, and, I, and it is to my benefit then to make sure that I provide, and, and I am required to have to meet certain quality outcomes, right? Now I have all the incentives in the world to make sure that I provide that care in the least restrictive setting that gives me the best outcomes, and if that means that I can take money to pay for transportation, to keep the person in the home, or to upgrade the home so that the person can stay there, I have the resources to do it. That's what happens with the places, the few places that have the insurance product as part of them. Today, I can't take a regular reimbursement system and pay for something that's different than what the reimbursement system says I can use it for. Because now I'll have a federal audit and they'll be in saying I misappropriated funds. So it's only in a capitated risk environment that you can actually have the freedom to do the kinds of things that you're talking about. Now, one of the things I didn't address, by the way, there's lots of things we didn't talk about here, uh, is the whole palliative care issue, long-term care issue, because the other point to keep in mind here is most of the discussion is about what you do with you know, um, uh, employers and the people who work for employers, the person who's 30, 40, low f early 50s, and how we're going to reduce their costs, right? As if by reducing their costs, we'll reduce the overall cost of health care which will not really happen. We may reduce the cost of health care to that employer, but the overall health cost, cost of health care is not driven by that population. It's driven by the long-term care and disabled population at the last six months of life. And there's very little in the law, by the way, that touches that at all. You know, 70% of the cost, like Medicaid in New York, 70% of it is long-term care and the care for the disabled. So we have the whole... This goes back to the education again on the palliative care, for example. One of the big issues is, as a physician, you know this. Not you, you as a geriatrician, we know each other. Uh, that's why she asked me an easy question. Um, but uh, as a geriatrician, you understand, but you also understand that one of the biggest issues with physicians is understanding the issues of palliative care end of life and figuring out how to deal with it. It's hard when you've been trained to save lives is hard to deal with the inevitability of death. And if all, the other thing in New York, by the way, that has to change is that most more people die in hospitals in New York than any other part of the country. People are sent to the hospitals to die. We've got to stop that and keep them out. Okay? Because that's not what occurs in most advanced places. You die in the home. Um, and when you die in the hospital, it's much more expensive and not a good environment. And you have the, 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 the great possibility of getting an infection. And we will have 16 specialists treat you in the last couple of weeks, which will do absolutely nothing for your health care anyway when you really need is pain medication and maintenance. But all of that, I believe, I've come to the conclusion after many years in this business that the only real way you can do this is to move to a capitation global payment, whatever you call it. These, some th these things, these names have bad implications, but you know what I mean, where I get a bulk of money and now I'm able to, I'm given the flexibility to use it. And that's, the, and that's the direction that we have to move in if we're ever going to make the changes. You will not make these changes under a traditional fee-for-service system. It just won't happen. I want to thank you very much for addressing the social determinants of health. I'm an internist um, and worked for a good part of my career in a healthcare setting, setting where the people had challenges, my patients, that all surrounded things, uh, and their health was sort of very low on their list of priorities to address. And we talk about quality all of the time, and I was at a meeting recently of physicians where one physician came to me and said, I'm in a town where when someone comes in who has four or five active medical problems, not well educated, low resources, the first thing the clinician says to them is, 
oh, I am not prepared to take care of you. I'm going to refer you to an internist. That means you have too many complications. My quality indicators will go down if I take care of you. Go see someone else. So I would like you to address how we balance taking care of people with all of these challenges with it impacting our reimbursement for having the hemoglobin A1C between six and seven in someone who can address that? It's the, I think in the long run it's the same answer as I just gave. Um, because in many of those situations, it's more than the health professional that has to be involved. And it's a lot of the other providers in the community that have to get engaged with, with, pay, with people like this and, and deal with um, the, um, the, 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 you need a collaborative effort among multiple providers. Driven, I think, the person, the entity that can be in the lead in many cases is the health system or the hospital or whatever you call it. And the, uh, the, if you're now I, in a capitated environment, I can pay you to provide the array of services to that patient, whether or not it's you doing it or the internist doing it, or whether or not there are services needed by other professionals that are not health professionals, not physicians, I mean and you're able to provide those other people with those payments. That's the, to some extent what, Kai, what Kaiser does a lot, and what Intermountain does, um, and what even parts of Geisinger does. But under the current financial structure, structure, we're not able to do it, not as effectively as we should. So I think it goes back to the payment systems. And without a payment system change, which I think over time, this will take a decade to do. And we have to build the infrastructure to be able to do it. Um, for example, you know, in one, near one of our hospitals right now, we're working with a whole group of local community-based organizations like the Family Service League, other social service agencies that also have, a, have some of this clientele as clients. Then they come to the hospital for an episode, but the care is not coordinated between what goes on with the physician, the hospital, and those social service agencies that see them all the time. And they, in many ways, are more equipped to deal with some of the issues than we are, but it's not in any way coordinated. And this is very, very complicated stuff. But if you don't deal with the social issues and you think that resolving the problems is just only the medical part of it, then I think you're not going to be dealing with the issue in the long run. Michael, perhaps related to the issue of social issues, we've not talked about uh, uh, mental health uh, uh, this right. morning. Uh, two sides of the coin. Number one, the seriously mentally ill who receive care in behavioral health silos, uh, and data shows that their medical conditions have the higher morbidities, mortalities, health costs, hospitalizations. And the other, the chronically medically ill who receive care in primary care settings, who the, 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 and the data shows that there is a huge underdiagnosis of depression, anxiety, et cetera, which if not diagnosed and addressed, will lead to continued uh, increased medical costs. And what model of care do you see uh, uh, most appropriate to try to uh, integrate those two uh, areas? Well, I think, I mean, I think that uh, we, we need to create like an institute for chronic illness, um, which is a, a, a collaboration of the various entities and focus on the multiplicity of issues, the comorbidities affecting uh, the, the chronic illness patients, and, and do as much of it as possible in the community. Try to, I, what I'm hoping, what I'm working on right now, for example, I think you may know this, is trying to get the state to enter into a capitated agreement with us to deal with the chronically ill patients. Identi we know who they are. I mean, you know who they are. And say, pick a thousand chronically ill patients with, with many comorbidities and develop a, a demonstration project, right, so that you have, a cap ca you have a capitated payment where you're very flexible in being able to deal with the multiple issues that people have and you keep them away from the hospital as much as you possibly can. Uh, and it requires providing payment to providers other than physicians. Physicians have to be a key part of it, but provide payment to those other than physicians. And I'm hoping that you will see a lot of these demonstrations like this over the next couple of years. This is also was addressed, by the way, as part of the Medicaid reform movement recently in New York as part of the, the Medicaid Re the Redesign Task Force, and is on the agenda as a committee to deal, to address over the next nine months so that we can come up with different models of care. That's where most of the cost is. Um, I've just been given the high sign to get out of here. Um, so again, I want to just thank you all for listening. I appreciate it. I know you're going to go to lunch, and I know it's getting hot in here. So thank you so much.